Well, the book of Matthew is one of four gospel accounts um, of the life of Jesus that are given to us in the Bible. Uh, we believe that it was written to us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, um, which doesn't mean that it's not a human book. In fact, a follower of Jesus named Matthew wrote it down, but God superintended that process so that every word was, was given by God. And it was written to present us an accurate and compelling picture of Jesus Christ. And over the next year or so, as we go through this book, if you are here and you don't yet believe, I would challenge you to just be reading this book at face value to see if the picture of Jesus that's in this book doesn't resonate with you. I mean, it may not prove anything to you scientifically, but sometimes when you eat a meal and you find that that meal is delicious, it's not because you had scientific proof that it's delicious, it's because you tasted it and it's good. The proof is in the pudding or in the steak, or in the pasta. The, the proof is in that thing that you eat. And as you read through the scripture, you'll see Jesus, who has been presented by Matthew now for 2,000 years to people, and people have found him to be satisfying and true over 2,000 years. Uh, this book has shaped and changed lives and eternities. The teaching of Jesus in this book has shaped whole societies and families and individual hearts. And the sacrifice of Jesus as described in this book has softened some of the hardest hearts that there are. And then the resurrection of Jesus toward the end of this book has given hope and joy and delight to millions upon millions. And as we go through this book, Jesus will say things and he'll say some things that we can't get away from because his words are true and his words are profound. Some of his words are, are haunting. Some of his words frustrate us because we know we're not living according to them, but we just know that they're true. And this book is one of the places where, where a pearl of infinite value is hidden. And Jesus said that it's worth selling all you have to get that pearl. And Jesus is presented in this book is the one that your heart is after and the one that my heart is after, whether you're a believer or a skeptic. And so I'd encourage you to join us this year, reading it, thinking about it, memorizing portions of it, discussing it in small groups and over dinner tables, and then altering your life and commitments according to what we read about Jesus here. Our main goal in preaching the Bible week after week is to present Jesus, because he is the one that we all come in here this morning needing. If you come in this morning and you don't believe at all, you may not agree, but I believe that your biggest need is to turn from what is ultimate to you and turn to trust in Jesus, to turn from sin and selfishness and to trust Christ. And if you come in here today believing, you also come in like me with many things that have clamored for your attention this week. Many things that have tried to be ultimate in your life. Many things that have offered you a false peace and a false security. And in our faithlessness and in our selfishness, we've often turned to those things to satisfy. But our biggest need as believers who come in this morning is to turn from what's become ultimate to us, but shouldn't be, and to turn to trust in Jesus, to turn from our sin and selfishness to trust in him. And the Bible is the book that was given to us by God to present to us a compelling picture of Jesus that we could believe in. In John 5, 39, Jesus said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life and it's they that bear witness about me. It's when we see Jesus as true and his words as compelling that we actually get faith and grow in faith. We don't grow in our faith by trying to work directly on our faith. We grow in our faith by looking to the one that our faith is in, by, by looking to Jesus. S similar to if, if your love has grown cold in your marriage, you don't fix it by working on love directly. You fix it with time communing with your spouse. And so if our faith has grown cold, if our faith has grown weak, we don't fix that by directly working on our faith. We fix that by looking to Jesus. And so the main goal as we gather week after week um, for in every text of scripture is to show who Jesus is, to show why he's worth going to, to show why he's the one that our hearts are longing for. In some weeks, as we go through Matthew, the sermon will seem very practical because Jesus called us to do some things and we wanna take those at face value and try to do those things. But some weeks won't be like that. Some weeks there will be only a display of the goodness of Jesus. And the practical application of that will be trust him. Trust him with your life, follow him, hang your life on him, worship him, love him, obey him, he's worthy. 
And now today's passage, because we're starting at the beginning, may not be one that you expect to find a whole lot of exciting stuff in. Uh, The first 17 verses of Matthew's gospel are a genealogy, which at face value may not be super exciting. Um, You probably didn't wake up today saying, oh, I hope we do the genealogy this morning. Like that, that wasn't like the dream that got you out of bed this morning. But we are going to work through this, and not just to be weirder than the other churches, we're, we're going to work through this because there's real gold here. There's some good stuff that we need. Matthew is writing this account of this man that he spent three and a half years with that completely changed his life and eternity, and he started by telling his, his backstory. And so Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, he says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And that word that's rightly translated genealogy there could also be translated Genesis. And we, not, we may not be all that excited about working through this genealogy, but Matthew is excited to present this to us because this represents a whole new beginning. If the human author, Matthew the tax collector, also called Levi, is a man who was called to be an apostle by Jesus Christ himself and who was a participant in the ministry of Jesus. He spent years with him. He was an eyewitness of Jesus. Jesus even called him a friend. And Matthew was a Jewish guy who was writing to a largely Jewish audience. Uh, These are people who had been raised learning the Old Testament in their synagogues. They'd been raised to know the law or the commandments of God. They had a national history together um, as a great nation that God called to be a unique people. He called to them first in the book of Genesis and called them to come out and be his people. They were enslaved in Egypt, but then God, by his powerful hand, rescued them from Egypt, established them as a nation in Canaan, and they were on again, off again in terms of their faithfulness and power. So they were a people of enormous God-given potential and promise, but it was potential and promise that was never quite realized. And it wasn't quite realized because on the whole, their nation was disobedient, Foreign nations came in and took over, often as discipline from the Lord. Their kings often became corrupt. And if they were honest, no individual could say that they had kept God's law and kept God's word. So from the book of Genesis on, they were called to be a people that stood as this unique light to the nations, but they never quite got there. And now at the time that this was written, they are occupied by Rome. They're they're divided spiritually, never really having become what they wanted to be. They're left with just a longing. In their book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, the book of beginnings began with a lot of hope where God created the world and then created them to be a new people, a light to the nations. But then you get to the last book of the Old Testament and the last word in the last book in the Old Testament is destruction or curse. And that had been written 400 years before the book of, before the time frame described in the book of Matthew. So for 400 years, they hadn't heard from any of the prophets For 400 years, it was like God hadn't been speaking to them. It was 400 years of silence and probably an awful lot of wondering, has God finally just ditched his people? Did God say, I've had enough of you people. I'm out of here. No more. You broke the covenant, so I'm done. For 400 years, they were wondering. But after 400 years, wondering if God had finally left them, Matthew starts to write about this promised one who had come. They had been longing for this promised kingdom and a promised king. They were longing for a power that would come and change them eternally. They were longing for the glory where they would have real rest and be a real light to the nations, but they never quite got there. And so while circumstances are different, people are the same and their longings aren't too different from ours. We long for a good king and a good kingdom. We long for real power that can change us. We long for glory and rest and peace and to be the light that we're supposed to be. We all want a true king. We we know that our leaders in our country aren't what they should be. We know that our church leaders aren't what they should be. We want better leaders. We're frustrated with our own lack of power, with our own sin and and the way that we keep falling into it, and also the lack of power that we tend to see in, in the church around us. And we want to have rest. We want to have rest from the religious burdens that we carry. And the circumstances were different in their day, but but people are the same. He writes to people like us, people who are frustrated, people who struggle with hopelessness, people who are longing for more. And so writing to these people who woke up with that hopelessness every day, who sensed that they could be so much more, Matthew starts by saying, this is a new beginning. 
It's like a new book of Genesis. The story is starting over again. We know the story of failed Israel, but this is going to be the story of the true Israelite, Jesus Christ, the true Jew, the true son of God who will come to redeem. And this genealogy that he writes here is not given as a thoroughly detailed list of every single generation um, since the very beginning. In fact, in verse one, you can see that Matthew, the way that he writes out genealogies, he skips lots of generations. When he sums the whole thing up, he says that Jesus is the son of David, the son of Abraham. And we know that Jesus wasn't the direct son of David. We know there were hundreds and hundreds of years between them. We know that David wasn't the direct son of Abraham. There were hundreds of years between them. But he's calling out these three especially to tell us something about who Jesus is. He condensed the whole genealogy to these three people, Jesus, David, and Abraham, to say something really specific. That Jesus came in their line. Jesus came as one of them. God had made this covenant with Abraham and he said, Abraham, I'm gonna bless all the world through you. Your descendants are gonna be as numerous as the stars in the sky. God made a covenant with David in 2 Samuel 7, where he said there would be a descendant that will come and reign on your throne forever. And so when Matthew's writing this and pointing out that Jesus was descended from Abraham and descended from David, he's saying that Jesus is the one to fulfill those covenants. And as we read through this genealogy, Matthew expands those, those uh, generations a little bit, but he'll still be skipping a number of generations as we go through this. He doesn't pretend that he's not skipping them. He doesn't pretend that this is exhaustive, but the ones that he includes here, he includes for a reason. And that's to tell us more about who this Jesus is. So Matthew 1, 2, he says, Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the far father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of David, the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. So by tracing Jesus' genealogy back through this line, especially through King David and including so many of their great patriarchs, Matthew's making clear that Jesus is the king. He is the king that they're waiting for. And this is a big deal because in earlier in their story as a nation, God had told the people of Israel, you really don't want a king. And they said, well, we look around at all these other nations and they have kings and it seems to go well. They have these guys with their thrones and their armies and their power. And we would like a king like that. And God says, no, you don't really want a king like that because they'll come and they'll oppress you. I'm going to be your king. You're going to be a unique nation. You're not going to have a king like them. And the people said, but we want a king like them. God said, no, you don't. And they said, we do. And so God said, all right, fine. I'll, I'll give you what you want. And they get a king. The first one goes crazy. The second one commits adultery and murder. The third one leads the nation into idolatry. And it really kind of all goes downhill from there. So they had this longing for a perfect king. And God says, you're not going to find one among humanity but he lets them have the king that they want. And the king that they want just ends up doing all the things that God had warned them about. And so they're left with this longing for the perfect ruler to come. We have this same thing. I mean, the same longing shows up again every single election cycle where we convince ourselves that finally this will be the one true president. This will be the one who can rescue us from all of our problems. Finally, we've got our person. If we can get that person in office, then that person will essentially save us. We have this longing for this perfect king. But Matthew says all of that longing is misplaced because Jesus is the one true king. He's the one who can meet what are truly our deepest needs. He's the one who reigns justly. He's the one, and we'll see later in this book, that is God himself coming to reign among his people just like he designed. Jesus is the true king, bringing the true kingdom where, where his followers live according to his ways. And because we know that Jesus is the true king, we know that we're called to obey him. Also, because we have a true king in Jesus, this means that we can live free lives under his leadership. And that makes us people who are very hard to manipulate when we live under other governments and authorities. 
And back then the mantra under the Roman Empire was Caesar is Lord. He, he, Caesar was the king, Caesar was the Lord, you worship Caesar. And then Christians came along and said, no, actually Jesus is Lord. And Caesar, sure, we'll obey him as much as we possibly can, but ultimately he is under the reign of Jesus. Caesar's not our ultimate true king. In fact, Caesar only reigns because Jesus lets him. Well, Caesars don't like to hear that. And so they killed an awful lot of Christians because of it. Um, they were afraid of these people who had this higher allegiance to a different king than their king. But having Jesus as king does temper all of our other allegiances to all other authorities. I mean, you go into work and your boss has some power over his employees because they think that he's the final authority, that, that he's the, the ultimate one. When it comes to determining whether they're gonna be able to pay their bills and feed their families, the boss is the one who decides. And if my boss doesn't like me, he may fire me and there goes my salary, the, the kids don't eat, it's bad news. Now as Christians, we know that ultimately that's not true. God has the final authority. God provides for our family. God is, is the one true king. And our job is certainly to, to be as faithful uh, of workers as we possibly can when we go to our workplace. But if your boss puts you in a situation where your conscience is compromised, you can disobey that boss without fear because the one who holds your soul has higher authority than the one who holds your paycheck. If Jesus is our ultimate king, we can be really free people under any government, in any company, with any boss. But Jesus as king frees his followers from the things that many earthly rulers and leaders use to manipulate and, and leverage their subjects. Earthly rulers thrive on the fear of their subjects. People submit to their leaders because they have to, otherwise those leaders could tax them or regulate them or even in some cases kill them. And those are the kinds of things that you fear if those things are the most ultimate things to you. But Christians who love Jesus don't love money. They can certainly tax us more and we won't like it, but we're not losing anything ultimate. Christians don't see death as ultimate. We don't fear that ultimately. So what can any earthly leader do to us? Nothing, really. I mean, if Jesus is the king, then, then earthly leaders who would use those levers on us lose their levers. Which doesn't mean that we live like defiant jerks. The Bible actually teaches we submit to authorities like bosses and professors and kings and governments. But we submit willingly. Not because we're afraid of the leader. Not because we desperately need something that that leader has to give us. But out of love for the Lord, love for that leader, and love for the work. So we're totally free as Christians because we have another king. And that's a big threat to people who would control people with, with fear or with money. But this King Jesus came and he is a real king, but he brings a very different kind of kingdom. In John 18, 36, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from the world. There's coming a day where Jesus will reign on earth and he'll come with his followers and make war on his enemies and conquer. But today he reigns in a very real way, but in a way that we don't see. He rules over all the, the kingdoms and the rulers on earth. He's a king, but not a king like all the other kings. He rules with a different power and a different authority. And one of the things that tells us he's different right away is that in Matthew's genealogy, Matthew isn't excluding some of the people you would expect him to exclude if he's just trying to tell a good story about Jesus. I mean, he's trying to lay out the fact that Jesus is the king. And, and in doing so, he goes to Jesus's lineage to, to tell his story, to tell where he comes from. But Matthew, which would have been totally surprising in their day, includes some generations that had totally whacked out crazy family members. And this wasn't normal because like King Herod the Great, he was a great worldly king and he had his genealogy purged of all the unmentionable people in his family tree to show that his line was pure and that he was a purebred, wonderful, God-sent king. So he basically lied and created an image and, and purged his family tree so that he could get everybody else to follow him and believe him. But Matthew here tells it like it is. 
He tells the story of, of all these horrible things that happened in the line of Jesus. He mentions Judah and Tamar. Uh, Tamar was the wife of Judah's son that died. She was his daughter-in-law. Her, her husband died and Judah said, wait for my next son to grow up and then you can marry him. But he doesn't fulfill that promise and so she waits for a long time and then she's waited too long and then Tamar goes and dresses like a prostitute and gets Judah to sleep with her in a dark tent where he wouldn't recognize her. And out of that unholy union came Perez and Zerah. And Matthew intentionally includes them in this genealogy, which serves as proof of some of the authenticity of what Matthew's doing here. He's not trying to make up a fake story. He's trying to tell the truth. But also in intentionally including these names, he's showing us that Jesus is a different kind of king with a different kind of power. And I'll unpack that a little bit more in a second, but, but look at who else he includes. In verse five, he mentions Rahab the prostitute. You get to verse six and he mentions David. And so you're thinking, all right, finally, we get some good blood in this line. Uh, finally, we're not talking just the crazy family tree of Jesus here. We've got David. He's the one we would boast about. We would all say, yeah, I'm related to King David. And David fathers Solomon, but Matthew makes it clear here that he didn't follow Father Solomon by his own wife but by the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Matthew deliberately points that out. We don't have time to tell the whole story now, but, but David saw Bathsheba, Uriah's wife, bathing, and scripture says that he took her, he had her husband killed, and Matthew doesn't omit that from the king's line as he's telling the king's story. There's no veneer, there's no varnish, he says that even King David was bad. He included that story of evil in this genealogy because it really was in the genealogy and because it was true. Also back in verse five, he mentioned Ruth and Ruth was a great lady, but she was not Jewish and Jewish people were, were big on having a pure lineage. As a Moabitess, she was a descendant of a guy named Moab, a non-Jewish man who not only had what would have been considered a less than pure lineage, but his dad and grandfather were the same guy. Like Lot fathered him with his own daughters. Matthew goes on and he mentions Rehoboam, a, a crooked king. It says, and Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, and Abijah, the father of Asaph, and Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram, Joram, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh, the father of Amos, Amos, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And if you go back and read some of their stories in the Old Testament, this is a mix of relatively good people and some really bad people. It's a mix of faithfulness and faithlessness. It's a mix of holy people and also wicked people. And Matthew didn't purge the wicked from the genealogy. He didn't work around any of it because Jesus is a king who came to redeem real humanity. He came into a messed up family whose lineage had some bright spots, but also had a lot of really ugly ones. Jesus came as the descendant of prostitutes and crooked kings. His mom was, was a single mother and people questioned Jesus's origin. Jesus came, but he didn't wait for the situation to be good so that he could go there and be comfortable. He wasn't a king who lived for his own comfort. He was a king who came into the broken situation to bring redemption. This is what this king was all about. He came to bring light to darkness. He came to bring life to a dead family and a dead world. And that's why we call Matthew's book a gospel. The word gospel means good news. And the, the Christian message, the gospel is the good news that in spite of how sinful we are, in spite of our past, in spite of the dark spots and our sins and failures, there is a good king who came to bring us life. The good news is not that Jesus came to provide a way for you to work hard and make yourself good enough to be accepted by God. That's not good news, that's, that's law, those are demands. And we already proved through a lot of history that we don't keep the law. The gospel, the Christian message, the good news is that we are incredibly sinful, but still God came for us. 
He came right to sinful people like David and Rehoboam and Rahab and Lot and you. He lived that perfect life you couldn't live. He died the death you should have died. He did all the work necessary to make you new. And the gospel call is to receive that gift by trusting in him, by turning from unbelief and whatever it is that's driving us and turning to trust in Jesus. Jesus came not to give us new law, not to come and say we finally perfected humanity, so now we're worthy. He came to step into the mess and redeem. And Matthew had to love telling that story. Matthew was a Jew from the town of Galilee. It was a rural region about 40 miles north of Jerusalem. Um, The Jews there were considered real Jews, but certainly less sophisticated than the other Jews. And you see later on, people just kind of mock them by saying, hey, can any good thing come from Galilee? They they were were certainly the rednecks. They didn't follow all of the Jewish religious customs. They didn't do all of the formal washings. And Matthew, not only was he a Galilean Jew, which is a little bit suspect, but he was also a tax collector. And tax collectors were not loved by their fellow Jews. And the biggest reason is that they were sellouts to Rome. I mean, the Jews hated the fact that Rome was occupying their country. And the tax collector's job was to be an agent of Rome who went out and collected the taxes that were necessary to keep Rome operating. So they worked for the bad guys. And they were really, really bad guys. We'll see in a few weeks that the Romans were were child killers. Herod was the king when Jesus was born, and he was another Jew working for Rome, and he didn't like that someone else was being called the king. So we'll see in a few passages that he ordered a massacre of all the male children under two in Bethlehem to protect his power. And Roman leaders always had a reputation of that kind of brutal rule. It was their way or the highway. They ran the place. They would line the roads with crucifixes to show what would happen to anyone who rebelled against Rome. They they had brutal rule. And tax collectors like Matthew were the guys who helped them keep doing it. So they weren't liked because they sold out their people to these brutal rulers, they stole their freedom and even killed some of their children. And they also weren't liked because they earned part of their living by just adding a margin to what they were supposed to collect. So in our terms, if Rome said, go collect $1,000 from everybody, they could go out and collect 3,000 and they get to keep the difference. So they made their money and, and became very wealthy on the backs of their countrymen working for Rome. And so obviously they weren't generally liked by society. And because they weren't, they just really hung out together. They formed communities of tax collectors because they were the only ones that would hang out with tax collectors. Their only friends were the other tax collectors. So they built society within the society where they could have some friends. So they had these strange and shallow friendships that were held together by their common shady practices. It was just sort of a lonely and cold life like being a Jets fan in Rochester. Like you you look around and you think like, are there more of us? Is there anyone else? There isn't, there isn't, you're by yourself. And and maybe if you can find some Jets fans, you'll you'll hang out together. But Matthew was, was alone with the other sinful tax collectors. He was an outcast until he met Jesus. Jesus stepped into this defiled family tree He stepped right into the life of this shady outcast tax collector. He called to him and Matthew's life was completely changed. The money that was previously the most important thing to Matthew lost its value compared to Jesus. Later on, Matthew will record a parable where Jesus compares his kingdom to treasure that's hidden in a field, which when a man finds, he goes and sells all that he has to buy that field. And in Jesus, Matthew found that treasure. He left his high paying, cushy job to follow another Jew from Galilee, Jesus Christ. He saw something more important than money and ease. He dropped his career, he followed Christ. And there's probably a special delight in Matthew in telling the story and and telling this genealogy where Jesus stepped into this genealogy of sinners. And then later on, Matthew records that people would mock Jesus by saying that he was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Matthew 11, 19, he said, the son of man came eating and drinking and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And Matthew had to probably write that down kind of smiling. So yeah, he, he is a friend of tax collectors and sinners. They mock him for that, but that changed everything for me. 
The gospel message is great news, that Jesus doesn't come to the healthy, but he comes to the sick to be their physician. He comes for the sinful, he comes for the broken, he comes for the needy. He came for people who carried either secret shame or public shame. He came to forgive the treacherous. He shared meals with them. He went to the most despised ones in society to bring them grace. Maybe if if you're new around here, you can have this tendency to think, well, I've screwed up my life so badly. I can't be a Christian now. I never could be one. But Jesus came to redeem people just like you. He didn't step into a perfect family and a perfect kingdom and surround himself with perfect people. He surrounded himself with the shady, the broken, the outcast, the sinners, those who had a ton of reason to feel guilty. He went to the people that nobody would touch. In fact, he spent so much time with them that that became the thing that they used to accuse Jesus. He eats with these people. He talks with these people. Look at him sitting at the table with tax collectors and sinners. Why is he doing that with those people? Remember, as our king, we we follow him. And sometimes as Christians, we have a tendency to protect ourselves from sin, we think, by not getting near to the very types of people that Jesus came to save. We have a tendency to isolate. We have a tendency to hide. But he's called us to be a light as he was the light. Your campus needs you to be a presence there for good. Your family needs you, as messed up as it is. Your coworkers who spend every weekend drunk need you to be the presence of Christ in in your workplace. Your students who live more like Rahab and more like Judah than Jesus need you to be there to show them what a Christian is like and to bring Jesus to them. So we're called to follow our king who stepped into the mess to bring redemption and hope. Not to run from the mess, not to isolate from it. That's not Christian. And we can be so quick to cut off those that need redemption and we do it in the name of Jesus who went to the very people that we're cutting off. He came to to redeem the worst. He shockingly ate at the homes of the tax collectors and sinners. He he eats in Matthew 22 at the house of Simon the leper. And, And normally you didn't go to the house of a leper. You didn't touch a leper because they would infect you and then you were made unclean. But Jesus reversed that whole thing. He made it so that he would go into those places and he would make them clean. This is the kind of power that he brings. The gospel has power to make clean. The gospel has the power to sanctify you and make you even more holy as you engage with sinful and broken and difficult people. And when you sit with the hypocritical, when you sit with the difficult, when you sit with the addicted, when you sit with the people who've made messes out of their lives with their sin, You're doing so following your king. We're called to engage with the same kind of people that he engaged with. He sat with them and ate with them and loved them, and we follow them. We follow him, not to be like them, but to see them redeemed. And it might just be that that person that is the most reviling to you, the person that's the most frustrating to you, the person who makes you angry to even think about them, that might be the candidate for your love and grace so that you might present to them the love of Jesus and his gospel. Verse 12, it says, And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiad, Abiad the father of Eliakim, Eliakim the father of Azor, Azar the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, Achim the father of Eliad, and Eli- Eliad, the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar, the father of Mathen, Mathen, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. And at Christmas time, we're going to be coming back to some of the passages about Joseph and Mary. We're going to actually kind of skip over that section for now until December. But there's an interesting last line of this genealogy, verse 17. He says, from all, so all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 
14 generations. So we have these three groups of 14 generations. We read that and we think, okay, 14, 14, 14, what's the big deal there? But this would have been a big deal to Matthew's Jewish readers. Um, God had set a rhythm for the Jewish life up around rhythms of seven. There, there were seven day weeks where they would work six and on the seventh day they would rest. That was the Sabbath day. That was the day that was holy. They couldn't work at all. They would only rest. And then that was extended to years. In Leviticus 25 verse four, but it says, but in the seventh year, there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. You shall not reap what grows of itself in your harvest or gather the grapes of your undressed vine. It shall be a year of solemn rest for the land. So they had the Sabbath day on the seventh day where they rested, but they also had a Sabbath year on the seventh year where they rested. And then God extended that even further by, by marking the seventh of these sets of seven years as the Jubilee year. And this was a special year where they just sort of turned off society so they could turn it back on again and started everything over. Leviticus 25, 80 says, you shall count seven weeks of years, seven times seven years, so that the time of the seven weeks of years shall give you 49 years. Then you shall sound the loud trumpet on the 10th day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, you shall sound the trumpet throughout all your land and, and you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you when each of you shall return to his property and each of you shall return to his clan. That 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. In it, you shall neither sow nor reap what grows of itself nor gather the grapes from the undressed vines for it is a jubilee, it shall be holy to you. And in that year, if your stuff was borrowed, it got returned to you. If you had sold some land that was your family's land, uh, it was always factored into the price that a jubilee year was coming and that, that would be returned to your family. Um, this kept the land allotted to the original tribes. If someone was a slave or an indentured servant, they were set free in that jubilee year. There weren't permanent slaves and permanent lower class people. If you owed debt that you couldn't pay, it didn't follow your family because all the debts were forgiven in the jubilee year. This was a year of celebration and rest and setting slaves free, forgiving debt, renewal in society. So what does that have to do with Matthew? Well, Matthew points out these three sets of 14 generations, the six sets of seven. But then there's not a seventh set of seven. There's just one name at the end of the list, Jesus, who is called the Christ. So the seventh seven is Jesus. Jesus comes and he's our jubilee. Through him, the slaves are freed. We were enslaved to sin. We were buried under our history, but Jesus came to set us free from that. Jesus comes and through him, the debts are paid. We owe this huge sin debt that could never be repaid and Jesus comes and pays the whole thing for us. He's the one who makes sure the debts are paid off. There are these 42 generations of toil and sin and hardship and finally Jesus comes and he's our Sabbath rest. For all of those years, we worked so hard to make ourselves acceptable to God. We kept striving, we kept trying religion. We, we would obey for a little while and we would fail. And then Jesus comes and forgives us. He declares us righteous. He clothes us in his righteousness. He declares us holy and gives us rest from all those labors. In Jesus, our peace and rest have come. And that's good news. That's the glory of this book, that Jesus is the one. He is the Christ, the anointed one, the one that our hearts are after. And the call for all of us is to rest in him. To believe that he is the king, that he does bring the true power that we find our glory and our rest and our peace and our future in him. In a second, the Christians among us will be invited to take the Lord's Supper. You're welcome to come up to these tables or back to those tables and grab the bread and the cup and move back to your seat and take them there. And as we take this supper, we, there are only forgiven sinners around these tables. 
There's nobody who's coming up here worthy to approach the Lord. There's nobody who can say, because I've got a great, great resume, the Lord has accepted me this week. We come up to these tables recognizing that the only thing that makes me right with God is that Jesus's body was torn and his blood was spilled for me. So it's only imperfect and forgiven sinners who come to take this supper. But the people who shouldn't take this supper are the impenitent sinners, those who have not repented. And so if your religion is just sort of show in veneer, we would encourage you not to take this table. If your sins are unconfessed and unrenounced, we'd encourage you not to come to the table. If you don't yet believe, we're, we're glad you're here, but in taking this table, we're saying we believe, so, so we would encourage you not to. If you're not actively seeking reconciliation with the other people who are eating this bread and drinking this cup, we don't take this. But for those who recognize I have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, that that happened even this week, that there's no way I could approach God on my own, and so I'm throwing myself on the mercy of Christ, I'm confessing my sins, I'm repenting. If that's you, then take this supper with great joy because it shows the Lord's death until he comes. It, it symbolizes the fact that Jesus died and was buried and rose again to pay the price for you, that he's our rest, he's our jubilee, he's our hope. Mm -hmm.